We have the equivalent of a 9-11 happening every three weeks. 72,000 people died last year. It's the number one cause of death for people under 50. I am addicted and I need help. There's a study that asks, how many close friends do you have who you could turn to in a crisis? The most common answer is none. As the number two ranking officer in the military, I worked to keep our nation safe, but I never realized that it was gonna hit so close to home. I was out there for five years, shooting up meth and heroin every two hours. We have an opioid problem. It's not safe. It got so bad, I had to go out and see the situation firsthand. We have an overprescription problem. It's easy to disregard people who you see on the street and never actually think about where they come from and who they are. I had a good life and I had a career. I had three children. One evening, my feet went out and my back hit the step. This is where my substance abuse with opioids started. I had to call Representative Pedersen and say, I know you've been working all day to end the opioid epidemic, but your mother is actually overdosed and is very close to death. 80% of the people who are addicted in this country are employed. They go to work every day. Doctors, lawyers, college students. Why don't they go into treatment? If you want to understand why people are turning in such huge numbers to painkillers, you've got to understand why they're in such pain. The opposite of addiction is connection. We brought a package of bills to address the gaps that people are facing at every level. Thank you so much. You don't see a lot of 65-year-old heroin addicts lying around. Now she should be dead. Two years ago, I was dope sick in a park. I can't believe where I am today. I'm sitting at a table with a senator, an admiral, and a congressman. The opioid won the battle, but uh, we're going to win the war. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed the screening of Coming Clean, and we are here with a prolific filmmaker of our time, Andy Timoner, um, who has done films such as Doug. She's done We Live in Public, which is actually quite frightening, uh, and it is October, so you should you should watch it because that has really come to fruition. Uh, and now she's uh, attacking the opioid epidemic with Coming Clean. So, Andy, thank you so much, first off, for making this film. And we have some amazing people with us that you just saw uh, in the film, and we're going to be talking to all of them. Andy, what motivated you to take on this type of uh, epidemic? Because there's been several films about it, but I've never seen one that was um, so personal and really invited us into these people's lives. And uh, you, you were introducing us to... Uh, you know, good people doing bad things. And I feel like that connection is what really just makes this film incredible. How did you get the thought to do this? Well, I was approached actually by the Parker Foundation um, who wanted to use art as a way into this subject matter. And so it, a part of this q and is producer Tori Lenos, who's a, a sister of Alex Parker and together it became, it was just a very important topic for them. Um, I didn't know too much about it, but I had documented in my movie Dig, I, I, Anton Newcomb, um, back in the day, was, was a heroin addict. And it had always stuck with me, just the grip of that addiction and how powerful it was. And, uh, and then I made a film about Russell Brand, who also had a huge battle with heroin. Um, so when I was approached with it, I started looking for all the films that were out there about opioid addiction. And I noticed that all of them, the reason why this one might feel more personal is because in those films, the characters that are being followed are often absolutely wasted and they're shooting up and they're hopelessly addicted. And the key word is hopeless. There was not a film that I saw solutions. There was not a film where I saw people rising out of it. Um, and that's where I felt like I had an approach that would be something useful for the world to have. Um, if I could find uh, find the solutions that work personally, but also on a policy level, uh, then it would be worth making this film. And so we started in treatment centers and that's when we met Destiny and Destiny had a relationship with Mayor McAdams and that kind of went from there. We just went across the country 
looking for stories of people who were radically transparent in their recovery. And that is why it's personal too, is because our subjects have such courage. And um, yeah, they stand up and they say, this is what happened um, and here's how it felt and here's what you can do. And, um, and so it's in that, in that, I feel like is the magic of the film. And it's been a life-changing journey for me, for sure. Beautiful journey. Yeah, beautiful film. And then Ben McAdams, when you went into that shelter and were sitting in that top bunk, uh, I was frightened for you. I just can't imagine uh, you going into that environment. And I'm sure I haven't seen anyone else, certainly in the public, put themselves in that type of situation. Uh, so how, I know you did, it was like a month long process that you were uh, really, yeah. you know, exploring all of that, but tell us a little bit more uh, about what that was like and what you learned from it. Well, it was actually, it was really scary that the night in the shelter, but it was, that was really the culmination of uh, a couple of years worth of work of, of trying to understand what it would take to help people to not just not just have people stuck in this revolving door of homeless shelter to jail, but to actually help people get back on their feet. And um, it had culminated with we had gotten some funding from the legislature to to implement some of the reforms that I was asking for, and that that part of their recommendation was, or with the the strings attached to the money, was that I had to be the one who personally found the location of a new homeless shelter. So that led to a dozen public hearings, town hall meetings where I was protested. You saw some of that in the film. Um, every time I see the film, I get PTSD from just thinking back of, uh, on those meetings where thousands of people showed up every time to, to protest the decision that I was uh, having to make. And um, at the end of it, I thought, okay, now it had culminated. I had to make a decision and I felt like there was just a missing piece. And that piece was, I needed to see it firsthand. And so I went out and spent it was three days and two nights. One night I slept on the street. The other night was in the shelter. And um, all of that, um, really, af after that experience, it, it was scary, but I came away with just a determination that I had to make a decision. And I was uniquely in a position to make a difference. And it wasn't about me at that point. It was about people who were suffering. And I was in a position to help and needed to do it. So we moved ahead. And um, it was through that process then that I ended up meeting Destiny, who, um, let me just give some context here. So I'm actually sitting in my car, which is probably obvious. I'm up for re-election. So it's been two years since I was elected to Congress. I'm up for re-election. It is, again, a very, very close race. And so uh, you you don't have a Saturday as a candidate a month before an election without out doing stuff. And Destiny actually just came from uh, she was dialing, talking to voters, helping us do voter outreach on the phone too. So a lot's happened in two years, but it was through that process that I met Destiny and we have become now friends, personal friends. And her son is uh, a friend of mine and uh, he actually is, is still dialing, talking to voters right now as Destiny, stepped up, as Destiny and I stepped off to participate in this uh, forum right now. Well, uh, I, and I'm so glad that you did. And yeah, seeing seeing people respond to where you were going to put that shelter really hit home because I think a, a lot of people don't take into consideration what they're saying no to, and maybe even I wouldn't have. Um, but having getting to see it and see really truly how ugly people looked uh, was shocking, and and that. I think made a, a caused a change in me, and I think that that will change people who see it. Um, and then Destiny, as soon as um, I saw you there answering the phones and talking to people, I realized, of course, she's going to be like the best person on the phone and the best person to represent you because literally, and she even just tell she's just innately strong, and your son is amazing, and he's also in the film. Uh, so tell us a little bit. I know I see I, I've seen it three times, so I feel like I know you, um, <laughs> you know, but um, tell us a little bit about what you think um, you would like to see people do that could help make a change. I think the barriers around stigma is huge. I think stigma tells us that um, it's the homeless addict underneath the bridge that's shooting up and getting high when in actuality it's the Admiral's son and it's other people that we know, you know, it's people with status and people with fame and people with money. I mean, stigma hurts the, that population so bad. 
And I would like to see some stigma be changed because of it. And I think this film shows that addiction hits everybody. It doesn't matter where you come from or what your background is or what trauma you've gone through, addiction can hit you. And if it doesn't hit you, it most definitely will hit somebody in your family. Well, which is why I also think it's so important that uh, both Stacy and Brittany Pedersen are here. And it was, uh, I thought the timing of it all, of seeing you while you were, you know, working um, and then, you know, cutting to your mom being in the hospital. Hi, Stacy. Um, I just thought that that really made that hit home. That, um, you know, I think sometimes people, there is a stigma and people don't ever think it's going to be someone in their family. And then if you do, you kind of think it's, you know, it's someone's brother or it's someone's child, uh, but it could be your mom. It could be your dad. It, lit it could be you, it could be anyone. Uh, so I know, I'm sure it's only strengthened uh, your relationship, but you can just tell us a little bit about that dynamic. I'm sure people would really want to hear it. Yeah, where to begin? It's been a, a long road. I'm now 38 years old and my mom became addicted to opioids when I was six. And so we went through really 30 years of how wanting to help my mom, but really not having the tools to do so. And she was at the end of her rope. Um, you know, she was overdosing multiple times a month. Uh, the last day she was brought to the hospital, she was, she overdosed three times that day. Uh, and we were able to get an involuntary commitment order on her, which you all saw in the film. Uh, and it was really because of the first, the first time my mom had access to to the care that she needed to, to get better. And, and what seemed impossible was all, all of a sudden we have our mom back. You know, the thing that we've been waiting for our, our entire life was actually happening and it could have happened so much sooner if she would have actually been treated with dignity and respect and uh, didn't have the stigma associated with her disease, like Destiny was saying. And if she would have actually been treated uh, when she went in for help decades ago, my mom could have lived a completely different life. And I'm so grateful that she's with us now. But I think, I hope that her story gives people hope where, uh, you know, also a perspective that this is a disease. It's a brain disease. There's a physiological change that happens. This isn't a moral failing. And when we give people the right care, when we prioritize that with policies, this really is a policy issue. And when we actually direct money and when we fund the programs that need to be funded, when we have the wraparound services, it, it is absolutely possible to overcome. Um, my mom was, you know, 30 years in and um, you saw the picture of her it, the last day that she was in the hospital and it, she looks like death. Sorry, that's my dog, Ollie, that you saw in the film <laughs> uh, barking at the neighbors. But uh, so if my mom can overcome it with the right care, so can any, so can everyone else. And um, so I, I hope that our story brings that, that hope and awareness of what's possible. And I'm so lucky every day to have my mom in my life. And, you know, this kind of makes me remember and reflect that how close we were to losing her, how unlikely it is for her to be there because you get used to having her, you know, I get to call her just about normal things now and the good and bad days, um, have her come over to see Davis and come over for dinner and just the, the all the moments that I would have lost. I apologize for the dog, I'll mute myself, but um, mom, do you wanna say anything about <laughs> your journey? <laughs> she just ran over here uh, from her house. She's She's not thrilled about the uh, running over for the interviews, as you all know, but. <laughs> I'm grateful to have you, Stacey. I'm fine. No. Uh, I guess I, I don't really know where to elaborate, except that uh, if it hadn't been for Brittany going through the court system, there, there just wasn't help for me, but she actually had to go through the courts just to get an involuntary commitment on me just so I could get help. But what is it like now being around your family? Yeah, and, and once the, it took some time for the fog to clear and I had, I had been out of society for so, so 
many years, like even little things like a cell phone, you know, I mean, um, I just lost many, many years in my addiction and, but it, it took Brittany going through the courts in order for me to get help. And once the fog did clear, I, I'm so grateful for every day that I'm here. You know, I try not to live too much in the past and have remorse, but I'm just so happy to be here now and enjoy my children and my grandchildren and hopefully live to a ripe old age. Yeah, I'm thinking you're going to. Yeah. And then Victoria Lennis, producer of the film, what made you want to get involved in this project? Um, well, my sister, who Alexandra Parker, she actually approached me with the idea of doing this. And um, I feel really fortunate because this is such an issue that I, closed, I hold so close to my heart. Um, I mean, we know that there's hundreds and thousands of individuals and their families who have been affected by, you know, this insidious disease of opioid addiction. And, you know, myself included in that and, and my family and so many friends and the sad thing is, it's a, is that nobody wants to talk about it still. It's still regarded, I, uh, as um, Destiny was saying, as something you should be ashamed of and something you should hide, a, hide, excuse me. And we were just really hoping to break that stigma. I mean, it's so polarizing, the subject of addiction, and it needs some empathy. And I think to pull from what Andy was saying too, is I think the way we wanted to present this is hopeful, you know, because hope that people can recover. It's not just this dark hole that you can't pull yourself out of. And that's what was so important to us. And I think that um, in educating other people and raising awareness to the complexities of what this entails and kind of understanding the pain that lies beneath it for so many people, that's so important because once people open up to understanding this, I think that's when we can heal and find solution, whether it's as individuals or as a society, you know, as a whole. And I think that's just so important. Um, I think a lot of people when they're faced with an issue like this and they don't have knowledge of it, that's a problem. I mean, who do you talk to about this kind of thing? And then people feel like they can't talk about it and they avoid helping themselves or helping others. And I think that um, it just all goes back to, to breaking the stigma and viewing this as the disease it, it is and not a moral failing as Brittany mentioned as well. So. Well, and you know, leave it to Andy to poke a hole in the mm -hmm. you know, big pharma companies that let's face it, are the yeah. biggest worst drug dealers in the world. Um, yeah. And I, I mean, after seeing the film, I hold them so responsible for helping create this. And, and I know that I know that you've got people going after them. Um, do you know anything more about any or any updates with those lawsuits? Um, we, we know that Mike Moore is, is expecting a, a conclusion shortly. And he's going to be good. Yeah. Yeah. He's about us. He's actually going to be joining our Q and A uh, for the national screening we're having that the Utah Film Center is putting on October 10th. So if you're interested in the latest updates, he'll be part of that. Um, and that's, I, I think you can just get tickets through that. Um, follow comingcleanmovie.com or on Instagram, you can find us. Um, the drive through that's on the 10th okay. of October in Utah. Also at the drive through I love that, drive-in. Drive -in. You don't get a burger. You never, you burger. Well, not. You can I don't know. I've never been to a drive-in, I have to admit, but I'm really fascinated by this whole drive-in, uh, yeah, movement in mm -hmm. COVID-19. It's been, it's awesome. And this film is going to go on and play drive-ins now in the hardest hit areas. Um, we're, we're locating those areas right now. We're partnering with different foundations to bring the proceeds to them. And we're also going to do a treatment center tour that I'm really excited about. So yeah, we just kind of wanted to come out with this movie as soon as possible because um, behind this pandemic, the opioid epidemic is the next one. It's like literally we're looking at 50% rise in opioid overdose deaths or more oh, yeah. in some states. Um, 
because of the isolation, because of the lack of treatment, because of, yeah, in person, there's no in person, but also as Brittany can attest, she's been asked to cut the budgets of the programs she fought so hard to put in place. Um, so, and, and Ben, you know, Ben is working in Congress and all of the talk, I've talked to Ben about this, is about the pandemic, which is understandable, but we're talking about probably over 100,000 dead when the dust clears this year. So we want to get this film to everybody because it, it, you know, yes, it does actually say where this all came from in terms of IMS, IQVIA selling our prescription data. That's insane. Yeah. That was the discovery we made through this film that is not public knowledge that really needs to be understood. The ramifications of that, which can extend in the future and cause other epidemics as, as Congressman McAdams actually pointed out that didn't, it, that's not in the final cut, but um, he astutely pointed out, like, couldn't this actually be used to cause future problems? Yeah, because they can pinpoint what is everybody, where are they, where are the users, let's put the drugs in there, you know? That is part of the film, but the big part of the film is how we get out of this and looking at these solutions. I mean, it is possible. Look at Stacy after 30 years of addiction or yeah. destiny, you know? Um, so I, I really hope the film gets seen by everybody, uh, uh, everybody who needs it, which is everybody, I guess. Yeah, it really is everybody because I, uh, you know, they're, they're, I think they've barely started pulling back on prescribing those meds. I know people that still you know, just had a knee surgery or just had this and they're still getting opiates. Well, you texted me. I mean, we're, we're good friends in, in real life. And like you texted me that you, what, two days ago were at the funeral of a 30 year old. Mm -hmm. who grew up across the street from you and died of an opioid overdose. Yeah, and he was a, a bodybuilder, healthy looking. I mean, I would, I, that's the first thing I thought is, oh my God, I, well, first off, I can't believe that he was still using. He had gotten him uh, after surgery years ago. And um, yeah, you know, you, so you can go to the gym and work out four hours a day and you can go home and die that night. I mean, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, it really does affect everyone and it's, yeah, I mean, it hit very, very close to home. Um, so what what can people do? What, any of you, this is open for everyone. What, yeah, can we talk about mental health parity? Can can Ben, Ben, can you talk about that? Because I feel like what you're saying is he was treated for the surgery, but really there were underlying emotional issues probably that that the opioids addressed and numbed for him, just right. like with Stacey. Well, even, yeah, even- like uh, Destiny being beaten by her husband, you know, it was not- it, it was treating something underlying that we're not addressing effectively in our country because well, of and the COVID, you know, as you pointed out, all of the isolation and all of it, I am, I, you know, I'm sure that played a big part of his death, certainly. Um, so yeah, you know, what do you, what do you think? How can we address these issues? How can we bring attention to these issues? What can we tell people to do? Well, I would say, I think we are um, more likely to lose ground than to make up ground in the next few months. So there is um, a case before the U.S. Supreme Court right now to uh, throw out the Affordable Care Act as unconstitutional. So it's the Affordable Care Act that gave us mental health parity, meaning behavioral and mental health has to be covered by your health insurance, just like physical health. And um, that, that came into law and figuring out how that fits in has been slow, but we're getting there. And, and then it's Medicaid expansion, which um, is what provided behavioral health, medic, uh, p mental health parity coupled with Medicaid expansion across so many states that just opened it up for so many people who are homeless and addicted. Um, they became Medicaid eligible and could get into treatment. And that's how, that's how we were able to double the size of our treatment programs in Utah and eliminate wait lists. And, and that's the program that Destiny was able to get into. And so there's a case before the Supreme Court that should be heard in November. As we know now, it'll be a very different Supreme Court than the one um, that existed a month ago prior with the passing of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And uh, if, if the Affordable Care Act is thrown out, so goes mental health parity and Medicaid expansion. And I worry that we then lose ground. Now, um, you know, President Trump says he's got a, a plan to replace it. Nobody's seen it. And, um, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm really worried about uh, that we lose ground 
you know, for so many people. Then it's also uh, coverage for people with pre-existing conditions, which I would think addiction would be a pre-existing condition. COVID is probably a pre-existing condition. I've had COVID, ha as have so many other people. Um, so I, I worry about what happens over the course of the next two months. Yeah. And Brittany, your thoughts? Yeah, um, Ben, I'm terrified to see what happens. And when I think about, you know, my mom's story and, and when she first started on medication assisted treatment, when I was younger, I remember standing in lines with her and driving down to Denver, which was 30 minutes away from where we grew up. And, you know, we'd be outside in the freezing cold in these lines. And my mom stopped taking medication assisted treatment because it was so hard to get. It was so far away. It was so expensive. And that's when she started looking for alternatives, started um, drinking, eventually, you know, moving to heroin. And so when I think about the Affordable Care Act and what it did to ensure that there was outpatient services, and, and now medication assisted treatment is so much more accessible. Uh, so even just that one piece, that's such a critical bridge for people to stop using heroin, which is much less, you know, you can't control how uh, strong it is, you're much more likely to overdose and die. Uh, and people can live uh, functioning lives and, and get, you know, have productive lives again when they're on medication assisted treatment. So even just that one piece beyond all of the other concerns I have around ACA is um, I'm terrified what, uh, what happens in the next couple months, but this election brings me hope that we'll have leaders that care about funding these things. Uh, we really do need federal dollars prioritized specifically for substance use disorder treatment. We have um, state grants that come down annually, but they're completely insufficient to, to actually treat the people that need it. It's, it's a very small amount relative to the problem. So we really need um, federal action at a large scale, as well as Medicaid coverage for inpatient residential and uh, inpatient residential and detox uh, for Medicaid treatment, because that's not covered. And that was part of our story with my mom is, is realizing through her experience begging for help and being turned in and out of the hospitals uh, without anywhere to go and her hospital bills being hundreds of thousands of dollars when her treatment was a fraction of that that actually you know that helped her um, so there's a lot we can do we have a long list and I know they're going to work on providing uh, materials on their website of tangible policy changes that you can do at the national and state level so uh, so people can look at that too in the future and Destiny, I know you've been calling people. What, what kind of things are you saying? I know you're, of course, uh, pushing the congressman, but what kind of things are you saying? And are you giving them uh, any of your history? Well, when you phone bank, you stick to the script. Okay. <laughs> so I've been sticking to the script. <laughs> Which is I was only on it for about 20 minutes because you had to go through a training first and learn how to use the system. So I barely touched base on it. I'll be doing it Tuesday and Thursday as well. Um, that one will be a text bank, but um, I only got two people on the phone <laughs> in the 20 minutes that I did it, and we just stick to the script. Yeah. Well, what would you say, though, about Congressman McAdams? Oh, here come the tears. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's a great human. He puts people before party. He's really interested in, in <laughs> human beings. Oh, sorry. <laughs> say hi, Brooklyn. Hi. Pretty high. We wouldn't be where we are today without the support of Congressman McAdams for sure. There's no way I would be where I am today. He took a chance on me and, and through that chance, I was able to see the skills that I still had because I had worked years before, you know, but because he gave me a chance, I was able to straight, strengthen the skills that I have. I felt more confident. I was able to pay my bills. I was able to walk with my head held high and those things make a difference in everyday life. And every opportunity that has came towards me because of him hiring me, I've took it and ran with it. Even though they're scary, even though I almost didn't show up that first day to work, I just took it and ran with it. He, he has brought out the strength in me. Well, I think that's such an amazing story. And again, one of uh, the things that I think makes the film so wonderful and so great and engaging and so different, what separates it from any other film regarding the subject matter is the fact that we do get to really 
I feel like know you and, and see, you know, your lives and, and it kind of experience that together and see, you know, when Stacy did the flip at the trampoline, I'm thinking, I can't, I can't even do a flip on a trampoline. <laughs> you know, Stacy doing a, a flip on a trampoline, but it really um, was, you guys are just all beautiful people. And Andy, you are an amazing warrior and Victoria for bringing everyone together uh, and making this happen. And it is, it's so engaging. The animation is great. Uh, I know Morgan Doctor was part of the musical score, amazing, haunting wonderful um and so i just i hope that everyone gets to see this and i know you're going to be at the drive-in i said drive through earlier uh but what else do you have upcoming with this film so we're playing uh let's see gosh i'm gonna blank now denver yeah. and Brittany's gonna host that one so we're playing denver film festival we're, we're closing night of bend film festival in oregon it's a great film festival Milwaukee, we're the centerpiece, and I believe we have a centerpiece event there. We're doing something in Minnesota, in Florida, Key West, um, which is actually going to be in person in Key West, uh, but we'll be beaming in for a Q&A with a Florida focus. Um, and I don't know, there's a bunch. There's a bunch I, I don't have off the top of my head, but um, we're going to be coming out nationally, and we'll have that news to to, to announce at some point here soon. Well, uh, comingcleanmovie.com is the way to follow it now. And what I love, I mean, the silver lining of this horrific pandemic is that we do get to be together on these Zooms and see each other quite regularly. And, and um, for whoever's watching, you know, we get to share the continuing story of this film, which is that everyone in this film is moving in this world to change this uh, for the better. And, and that's, you know, Admiral Winnefeld, who unfortunately had an engagement tonight, um, you know, he lost his son. But what did he do? He and his wife turned that into SAFE, who we're partnering with, actually. And they're making a huge difference across colleges and universities and treatment centers. So I think it's really like, it's important to realize you can always just take the worst and make the best out of it. And that's what this film's really about. And hopefully will inspire and a lot of people who see it. Well, you guys, thanks so much 